All right, my friends, the Build Show is live. That's right, we've got a live studio audience. I've got 4,000 builders in the audience today. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, just kidding, it's 100 people. And we're doing something we've never done before. That's a live event with me and three really smart builders up here on stage who are gonna be sharing all of our mistakes, all the things that we've done over the years, not all of them, as many as we can fit into this hour presentation that we've messed up and that we can look back on and go, hey, there's really a really good building science explanation for why that failed. So today's build show from Bethesda, Maryland with a live studio audience, all about failures and mistakes, sponsored by our friends at TW Perry, a part of Builders First Source. Let's get going. All right, guys, I appreciate you joining us. We've got a studio audience here in Bethesda, Maryland, but also some of you guys are watching this from your computers at home, or maybe you're watching this later. Uh, we got a really fun event, and I've got three really smart builders up on stage with me. And you'll notice that all four of us have a little bit of gray hair. And some of that gray hair is because we've done a lot of dumb things and made a lot of mistakes over the years. And on the build show today, we're gonna jump into some of those mistakes. We couldn't possibly uh, fit them all in but each of us have at least a story or two to tell. And hopefully, if you're watching this, you're gonna gain some wisdom from some older builders that we're hoping to pass on so that you won't make those same mistakes. With that being said, let me introduce who we've got on stage. First off, uh, George Fritz. George, will you tell us a little bit about your company? The company is Horizon Builders. We've been in business for about uh, for 40 years. Actually, it's our 40th year. And uh, we primarily build in the in the uh, DC metro area, and uh, but then again, we're we're we built in Florida, New York, up and down the East Coast. And George, you're mainly uh, doing projects with architects, right? Where they're kind of architectural driven projects. Yeah, about ninety nine percent. So we've got some good stories and a lot in common for sure. Ethan, why don't you go next, brother? Great, thank you. I'm Ethan Landis with Landis Architects Builders here in Washington D.C. We also work in the metro DC area. And uh, a little different than George and Matt, we have a design-build model. My brother Chris is an architect, and we've developed a pretty deep architectural bench within our company. So the vast majority of our projects are designed in-house, where we have a, a collaboration on the architectural side from the very beginning of a project. So just a different, a different process, sometimes a different outcome, but we've made our share of mistakes, too. Oh, yeah, for sure, Ethan. All right, Doug, you're up next, buddy. I work for BOA. Uh, we've been around for 30 years. We are a design build company. We focus on large scale renovations and on, we do a few custom homes every year too. Uh, like Ethan, we, uh, we still manage to make mistakes even, even doing stuff in house. So with the three of you, we've got 100 years of company experience right here in those three seats. And then I've been in business 15, 16 years, plus I built for other people for 10 years. So we're talking about over a century of building and a lot of mistakes that we've seen over the years. But before I get into those mistakes in particular, I wanna mention uh, kind of the definition of building science. And we're gonna get into a little bit today how you guys kind of started learning and digging into this as we share our stories. But first off, uh, I do wanna mention for my Bethesda crowd here, I'm a local boy. Uh, I actually started my building career here in uh, Manassas, Virginia. This is a house that I built in uh, around 1997. I worked for one of the big national production builders. Uh, and after I moved from DC, I'm, I got married here and lived here for seven years. I moved uh, to Portland, Oregon. And Portland is a, a very different climate than I ever lived, a very rainy climate, uh, marine uh, climate. And when I moved there, I started working for a semi-custom builder, a builder that built about 100 houses a year or so, uh, usually from a floor plan that uh, was provided to the clients, and people could customize. But this is, a, this is a locally owned Portland company, not a big national builder. And the week that I started with that builder, uh, we got, I can't remember if it was two or three, two or three lawsuits basically handed us in the very first week that I worked there. And I was the uh, kind of head superintendent was my job. And so my, my boss, who was the VP of construction, said, hey, Matt, I need you to handle these. And I was 30 years old at the time. You know, I'd been in construction seven or eight years. was like, uh, okay, boss, you know, whatever you need me to do. So I, I'm on, like, 
you know, day five of the job and I show up to this house. This house my company had built about a year prior. And this was one of our first houses we built with this new system. This is around the year 2002 called EFIS. I don't know if you have ever heard of this. External Insulating Finishing Systems. Uh, it's actually a good system. Uh, but when we started using it, we didn't know much about it. We kind of, uh, uh, we did it without necessarily thinking about what the consequences were going to be. So we started ripping the EFIS off this house. And EFIS is basically a, uh, a piece of insulation on the outside of the house that got a notch trowel glue and you stuck it onto the sheathing. And then on top of that, you would take out of this five gallon bucket, this synthetic stucco and you'd trowel on the stucco. And it looked like stucco from the street. You had no idea. But it was about half the cost of traditional three coat stucco, pretty lightweight. But the big benefit for builders besides the half the cost was you could promote that your house was now insulated on the outside. So we loved it. This builder that I worked for built about 10 houses or so with EFIS uh, in that kind of first year that, that we started working with it. Well, one of the lawsuits that we got handed that week, or two or three of them maybe, were for this house. So we started taking the EFIS off. And remember, this is a one-year-old house, and it was sheathed with real plywood. That's not even OSB. And you could probably tell from the photo what was going on. Look at those two, uh, that bank of windows up in that turned gable, and then the kind of blackish area. Here's what's going on there. Those windows above, the way that you finish the EFIS job to make it waterproof was any penetration through the EFIS, you went around and caulked meticulously. You, paint, you had your painter come out with a really high quality two or three dollar tube of caulk, and you would caulk around each one of those windows and really make sure you got a, just a top notch caulking job. And then when you left, you'd tell the clients, hey, you know, come out and inspect these windows every couple months because you don't want any cracks in that caulking. It's really important that we, that we have a really good caulk job that gets touched up on a regular basis. And of course, you know what happens when you try and face seal things, water is going to get in somehow, whether the painter did a perfect job or not, whether the caulking cracked or not, who knows what the story is. But water got in from these windows and one year later, that real plywood, which is a great building product, couldn't dry. Water got in and my friend um, David Nicastro says, if it can't dry, it's going to die. And here I was, this young builder, like, oh my gosh, you know, how many houses do we have like this? And I, I've never seen rot like this. I'd only built new houses. I didn't know what, what could happen to these houses. That same year, 2002, another big news story uh, was out that, uh, you know, Tom Brokaw on the nightly news was talking about the mold crisis. This is 2002. Show of hands, how many of you were building in 2002? A couple of you. Uh, everybody in the front row here was building in 2002. So, at the time, insurance companies were paying uh, mold claims and builders were getting sued for mold issues. And so several clients that had EFIS houses and actually some others that didn't were suing us for mold issues. People were worried their kids were going to die in their bedrooms because they were breathing in this black mold. And so here I was, this 30 year old, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I mean, I've been building houses for seven or eight years. I didn't know that people were going to die in these houses. Like, I should figure out what the scoop is. And so I started uh, learning about building science. I didn't even know the ter what the heck is building science. I don't know what that is. I never had that class before in college or high school. And so as I dug into it, this is the definition. And I love this definition of building science. But the part that I really cared about and still care about probably the most today is the bold part right there. To understand and prevent building failures. That's the part that is really where the rubber meets the road. You know, if you look at the four of us up on stage, we've started companies, we're owners or partners in companies, which means that if the company gets sued or if we lose money, that hurts us in our pocketbook. I was no longer, uh, you know, I, when I switched to building my own houses, I no longer got a regular paycheck from corporate. Uh, it's a big deal for me as a custom builder, as a business owner. Uh, to have failures or problems on my houses because that means I'm very likely not going to get paid this month if I'm spending that money to remodel or to fix someone's house. So this is all 2002 when I started learning about building science and like, hey, why are all these failures happening? Fast forward a couple years, 2005, I moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, I knew that I was in a very different climate when I carved my pumpkin with my Texas wife early October and my wife was like, no, nah, you can't carve your pumpkin in early October. You got to carve it like the day before Halloween. I was like, no, come on, let's, let's carve pumpkins. It's October 1st. 
Well, this is what happens in Texas after about two days of having your pumpkins sit out when it's, you know, 80 degrees outside and 80% humidity. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so here I was, now at this point I'd started my own company. I thought I kind of knew building science because I dealt with these lawsuits and EFAS. And here I'm a new builder in a new climate. And I was thinking, oh shoot, I better go back to the drawing board and figure out everything I can about vapor barriers and humidity. And well, how do I build differently in Austin, Texas than I might have when I lived in DC or when I lived in Portland? And we're gonna talk a lot about this. This is one of my favorite quotes. And with this being said, I'm gonna pass over the mic uh, to this handsome gentleman with a few gray hairs. Uh, and George has a few of these stories of his own and also has spent a fair amount of time with, with this guy that the quote was from. George, let me pull up your slideshow. Okay, you notice I don't have an in intro sheet because I'm not gonna own any of this. But uh, <laughs> this is a house built in 2008, nine, 10, right around in there. Uh, we got a call maybe 10 years later uh, eight, I think, and then call eight, 10, 12 years later and said, hey, I've got, uh, got some water leaking in the room below that, uh, that deck right there. So full room below that, and there's a door to the, uh, uh, you know, off, out, to this, uh, out to this outdoor patio uh, with uh, pavers. Uh, that window unit there, this is what it looks like after it was repaired, and it looked like right when we finished it. And I'll show you what the, uh, the problems were. Um, that's as we, uh, you know, we, we checked below, it was leaking, there's, I don't have any photographs on the inside, but it was leaking pretty profusely. And um, uh, there's two pound foam, closed cell foam, and the whole assembly, and I'll show you that. And it, uh, we found a fair amount of rot, and it started taking it up, you know, you're, we found a piece of plywood that you can see right there was exposed, um, and that should not have been. Uh, there's a shot underneath where the, uh, where the uh, roof meets the uh, vertical wall underneath that window sill. Hard to see from this photograph, but that window sill, you can see the black goopy there that should have turned under the window sill. And what happened is the windows got prepared, the rough openings got prepared, it had a liquid applied material on that sill, uh, pretty robust, and uh, it got cut out because the window was taller than the opening. <laughs> And then they, uh, the guys did not put the, uh, you know, did not put the waterproofing back in. Also, look at the far, uh, the far back of the the, uh, the photograph too. The second major issue that you know I kind of discovered as we were t doing the photo, that Gary would bring me the photographs. But you'll see that that's a uh, um, a interstitial space there that uh, you know has uh, sloped uh, framing members and then plywood over top of that. This framing deck rail uh, here has a, a torch apply, I believe, in the beginning, and then, or no, a peel and stick, and then, and then in that, on the top of that space was a uh, torch apply. So um, uh, let me just clarify a, a term. You said interstitial space. In other words, an, a, a section that had, uh, let's say, a flat deck, and then you framed on top of that flat deck with some sleepers and some plywood to get the slope going but that's an area that didn't have insulation, was unconditioned and unvented, right? That's right, okay. unvented, uh, and uh, you know, moisture is always a problem in that ty type of uh, space. Um, so the, uh, we cut some holes, and it didn't really have to cut too hard because that, that material was shot, and you can see that closed cell foam down there, and anywhere from six to seven inches. Fair amount of rot damage, um, and then we took all that up and we found that the TJIs, they don't do too well when, they, you know, when they're wet mm -hmm. and do not dry out. When they, you know, so this is, uh, it gets wet and then dries a little bit, but not 100%. It gets wet, dries a little bit, and a little, a little bit more. Before long, you've got you know, serious uh, degradation, which we had all along there. And we had to sister to those and then respray the whole thing and just fix the structure back up before we even got into the waterproofing. Um, this is a shot looking down from the upper deck with the torch ply on it, past to the bottom deck, which is the, uh, has the peel and stick membrane on it. And that is that space in there that moisture will collect. Uh, it's not gonna permeate through 
the non-permeable material both up and down, and that is a problem waiting to happen. The water, be the bulk water intrusion beat us to this issue. So uh, that but, issue is probably a 15 to 20 year issue. Let me pause you for one quick second, because that, that's such a, uh, a big deal that I don't think a lot of young builders, including young Matt, knew about, which is spaces in the house that uh, are going to have air in them, but are not insulated, they're not air conditioned, and there's an outside wall that gets cold. Uh, you know, I remember as a young builder, I had an inspector who was always making me put air hawks on my front porches and making sure that I'd vented places. And I always thought he was kind of a pain in the butt, you know, making me do all these extra things. And years later, I realized, well, he was helping me prevent what George was talking about right here, which is a, an enclosed airspace that's non-vented, that doesn't have insulation. It gets cold on the top of that roof deck. And as a result, moisture that migrates in there condenses, but has no way to dry. And so what George is saying is that's not a problem that will rot your house in two years, but it absolutely will over time. You know, a decade or two later, you're going to find some issues in, in those cavities if they're not vented. That's exactly right. Um, the next shot is just the waterproof. We chose to put a uh, three-part uh, Lorenco waterproofing system down. Um, Luckily, it was set up to be, you know, in future when, when there was a pro there could be a problem that you're looking at 20 or 30 years and you're going to replace the torch supply. Uh, the flashings were set up so that this could be turned up underneath the flashing. And at the house, it took a little bit more coaxing to get that product up there. And then it got sealed underneath of the, uh, you know, the windows very, very well. Normally, we, we um, have the window sills drain. And that's something I can show you in a little bit if you want to look at that. But uh, this is uh, uh, this is how we solved that problem. And then, of course, we flood tested it. We got a hose out, squirted it around a little bit, make sure it wasn't going to leak. Going back the second time is going back the first time is pretty embarrassing. But in the end, they say, "Well, you guys, well, you really you, you made a mistake. You came back. You owned up to it. Coming back the second time, you're a bunch of nitwits." You know, so yeah. <laughs> We're being recorded, so that's why it's in Yeah, that's right. I'm <laughs> There's probably another word very, that you, yeah, you'd yeah. use on that one. So the guy standing down there, can I say that? Can I, the guy, the Nitwit's guy fine, yeah. There? Nitwit's fine? Yeah. The guy standing there, everything drains to that edge, and it's pitched that way. Over top of that is a uh, drainage material, and then over top of that went the uh, pedestals on, uh, pedestals and then the uh, the pavers were put back on top of it, and that gives you plenty of drainage space. And that product there is primarily, not particularly, it helps with drainage, but primarily is there to keep the, uh, the, the dirt that collects and all the rest of that, and then also protects the waterproofing membrane, yeah. drainage and protection. Um, that's the window and, uh, you know, being uh, taped again, fully tested, and I believe that they, did a blower door test down below and looked and see if we've got any air leaking. Uh, and of course, you have air, you're going to have water. So uh, that got put back together that way. Uh, and that's pretty much it when it was in. Of course, they painted it and cleaned it up, but uh, that was a pretty uh, significant, you know, hit to the budget. That, I mean, it, it should have taken, you know, my guys you know, two days, but it took them way longer. Than <laughs> it took them probably a month to, to get that thing tight and right. A Let me ask you a lesson or two learned on that one, George, because, you know, when I, when I see a set of plans come through at my desk that has flat roof or even worse, flat roof living space above or even worse, flat roof living space above, but a walkable or usable space above, all of a sudden I, I get a little uh, uncomfortable. Uh, the hairs in the back of my head raise up. What do you think and what are the things that go through your mind when you see those plans? Well, you remember this, mm -hmm. and this isn't the first one that we've screwed up on. I mean, there's other things that, that you, you know, I got a leak here and, you know, you rush out there and you figure out what it is. You, you've got to constantly learn from the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Great thing about this kind of program that you're putting on here is that I can tell you guys what I, what I screwed up there, but, uh, it, but the people that listen need to say, hey, I, this is really, you know, a real deal. I, I have no idea. That cost probably is, was to fix that. It's probably $75,000, maybe eighty. But that, you know, it was 
not something that you want to take right off the bottom line. So, yeah. um, but then again, you know, our marketing is, you know, to our clients and everybody would know who these people are. And you cannot, you, you can't, I don't care if it's been 15 years later, you cannot not go back and make the repair. Yeah. You, you have to take care of it, part of our marketing. That's right. George, I, I want you to spend a little time on the fluid applied flashings that you moved to, but I actually want to come back to that in just a minute. Let's let's keep going with these guys, and then I'm going to come back to these slides on fluid applied. Sure. That's all right. Um, so, hang on one second, Ethan. Let me let me pop your slides up. All right, Ethan, take Great. it away, my friend. Well, and this is a very good transition from what George has just shared with us because we had a project about ten years ago that uh, new home, Northwest DC, that uh, we designed and built for a client who was very into energy efficiency, indoor comfort, and so we chose to use spray foam open cell in the roof structure and the walls, and as we uh, were building the house, Oops. this is the wrong I put the wrong one. slide on, I just realized, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, build show live mistakes, people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hang on one sec. Well, as he's getting to the right slide, I'll just prep you a little more of it. So it was a, a new single family home and we had a structure in the roof where the, um, it ended up being a cavity in the roof that was not very big, but big enough that moisture could collect in there. And as it was getting framed, the uh, project managers, the people on, on the job decided that they were going to sheathe the roof and then put ice and water shield over the whole thing rather than just eaves and edges. Which and you would think is a great upgrade, right? right? Ice and water shields, better than just felt. Right. So your guys were thinking, oh, this is great. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're doing the right thing, boss. Right. And so, and you can see in the cavity up there, there was air, air space. And after we drywalled everything, and the, actually the owner ended up selling the house three or four years later, and the new owner uh, ended up wanting to do some renovation, but had was looking at some buckling in the sheathing outside in a couple areas and said, hey, you know what's going on? So he hired an inspector and they figured out what was going on. They pulled up this uh, section of plywood in order to see the ice and water shield. And then it's hard to see here, but the, the nails were getting a little rusty and there was signs of moisture. It hadn't really failed yet, but it was not in a good, going in a good direction. So uh, we worked with the homeowner and negotiated and so forth. They were gonna do some renovation and cut some more holes, inspected things. We came up with a solution, but he really didn't want us to fix it. And so we ended up settling for $16,000 and just said, okay, that's, that's probably the best solution. He was gonna do an addition anyway and so forth. So that was a, a, a big lesson learned. We in our company now make sure that every project where we're gonna put in spray foam, whenever we have uh, any uh, condition space, that we make sure it's ventilated that, or excuse me, that it's conditioned by HVAC system. So heating, cooling, it pulls the moisture out of it. So any area where moisture can build up, it will cause problems for you. So you have to have, make sure the HVAC people are bringing in enough CFMs in there to dry it out, keep it the right temperature. And before you move on, let me, let me uh, let's talk through a little bit about why that failed and how bad that failure is. So first off, you mentioned you had about eight inches or so of open cell foam. Right. Which gets you our 40 something to meet code for your climate Oops. zone, right? Yes. Uh-oh, not and sure what happened to no, our- No, uh, I pushed the wrong button. I wanted to go back to the oh, insulation picture. I got you, brother. If you want. Hang on. It, so, it, yeah, it's probably uh, a, a good 10 inches of, of open cell. So we have open cell foam in the, uh, in the roof line here. And open cell foam, uh, because it's open, it's like a kitchen, I kind of like it into a kitchen sponge. You know, mm -hmm. if your kitchen sponge is wet uh, and you put it on your counter overnight, most nights it'll dry or be mostly dry overnight. But if you take that same sponge and you put it in a Ziploc bag and then put it on the counter, how long does it take to dry? Well, it'll never dry, right? Because it's sealed in a plastic bag. So he's got open cell foam, which, can, which has some ability for moisture to move through it. And then on his roof deck, he used peel and stick. And peel and stick, what's the perm rating of peel and stick? Not what's very the, much. How much drying occurs through peel and stick? Almost none. It's, it's in effect a Ziploc bag. So he's got the Ziploc bag on top of his roof. He's got this open cell foam. And humidity in our house tends to gather uh, in the attic. And there's a great article by Joe Stewart called Ping Pong Water 
where he actually had, has done some testing and realizes and realized over time that moisture actually accumulates mostly in the roof at the highest, uh, pardon me, at the ridge at the highest points of the roof. And if that moisture can't escape out of this uh, vapor impermeable barrier, which ice and water shield is, then as it accumulates in the sheathing on a cold day, right, it's humid in the house, it's cold outside, the moisture migrates through that open cell foam, it condenses on the backside of that sheathing, that roof sheathing, but it can't dry to the inside, that's when that rot occurs. And so uh, one thing we can do, I did a video on this, is we can do a vapor permeable uh, ridge cap on the outside. So if you're gonna use peel and stick, uh, check out Joe Stebrick's article called Ping Pong Water, which kind of talks about the science behind why you want a vapor open um, underlayment at your ridge in nearly every climate zone. Uh, and, and that would have, in theory, prevented that issue. The other thing that, that Ethan, I think, kind of went through quickly, but I want to make sure you guys heard it, was that there was no ducts in that attic. That, that space was insulated but non-ventilated. And so there wasn't duct work in there. There wasn't a supplier or a return or a dehumidifier to condition that air. It was just whatever was happening there. And as a result, that space was probably becoming more humid. And that humidity was gathering in the sheathing and causing that problem. Right. Would and you say that's a fair there, assessment? Yes. And, and there were other complications in the situation. The uh, fresh air ventilators, uh, we suspect, had been turned off for a while. And they'd done a lot of painting. So obviously, the moisture can come from a lot of places. But particularly after painting a house, you'll have many gallons of water that ends up somewhere. And that's for sure. Good point. Awesome, Ethan. All right, Doug. <clears throat> Next up. I'm gonna grab your you, yeah, throw that on slide 20 if you can. OK. Here we go. OK. Well, uh, we have a th weird thing that happened to us. We built a beautiful, beautiful custom home for some folks. And they called us the second summer after they moved in and said, hey, something weird happened. Last night when we were asleep, we heard this crash. And this picture had fallen out of our wall and woke us up. And I said, well, I mean, that is weird. And I'm thinking, like, well, I mean, it's a picture hanger. Why are you calling me? But uh, I run out there to be courteous. I'm nice. And, and um, the picture hanger had ripped out of the wall. And, and there was a hole in the, in the face of the drywall. Um, and the drywall was not, the core of the drywall was not the bright white that I'm used to seeing. It was like dark gray. And it kind of felt cool. And I, I run outside and I get my moisture meter and I come back up and I put it on the wall and it goes whew, all the way to the highest reading. And I was like, well, that's a little weird. And uh, so I'm like, you know, checking it on my skin, make sure the batteries. So, uh, you know, it, this was like right here. And then, uh, you know, so I start checking below. It's wet all the way down to the baseboard. I start checking above. It's wet all the way as high as I can reach. I get a ladder. It's wet from here to there to there to there. This entire wall soaking wet, as wet as my meter can read. And the next room, nothing. The, the wall next to it in the same room, it's totally fine. So I've got two exterior walls in this room. One soaking wet, one nothing. The next room, nothing. The room below, no problem. The attic above, a bunch of very dry, dead bugs. Nothing wet. No plumbing. So, you know, I scratch my head about this uh, quite a bit, as you might guess. Um, so, I guess basically, let me just orient us here. This is uh, this is the exterior. So, this wall is soaking wet on the inside, and nothing else on that elevation or the adjacent elevation is showing any signs of moisture. Um, <laughs> So this, I, I had no idea what was going on, really scratching my head. Uh, I asked a guy I know to uh, kind of a guy I'd worked with as an expert. He's an expert witness in a, uh, we did a rescue project where we fixed another contractor's problems and he was the guy who wrote up all the problems. So he's really smart, he's experienced. I bring him in, we walk around the house, I show him this, he gets his moisture meter, same thing. Um, and and uh, he's, he's kind of looking puzzled and I was like, well, let's go talk about this outside. And as we're walking out the door, the homeowner comes over and, uh, and grabs him and says, hey, um, what do you think? And he says, well, I don't really know, but um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. 
uh, people are really freaked out about mold, but it's just because of all the lawsuits and the million dollar uh, awards. <laughs> it's not really a big deal, I wouldn't worry about it. Oh no! Right? I really wish I had video. I mean, I'm not this sure if that's his exact words. Uh, and and uh, and he's a great guy, and the homeowner's a great guy. But and you could just watch the gears turning in the homeowner's head as he's saying these things. And I really wish I got a video. Like every expression I could make probably came out on my face, and I probably turned three different colors. Anyway, what um, year was this, Doug? This was '99. '99. Okay. Um, yeah. So in the middle of the mold stuff. Mm. Um, so. Uh, you know, a few weeks later, our fax machine starts humming. I actually happened to be in there, and uh, this is obviously a while ago. And uh, and this the thirty-seven That's a machine, page thing, by the way, that would spit right. out paper with writing on it. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the fax machine, uh, I know we got some young exactly, in the exactly. Uh, you can look it up on the internet. Anyway, um, yeah. And the first three pages was a letter with a lawyer's, uh, you oh. know, uh, thing on it, and it's, uh, you know, you did this, and you, your your defective bill did that, and the rest of it was like a consulting engineer's report, and a mold guy's report, and a this, and a what. Anyway, um, you know, we ran out and talked to the homeowner and said, hey, look. Uh, you know, this is not a direction that's going to be helpful for you because it's going to take six months for anyone to decide what to do. Why don't we just, why don't we start figuring this out with the team that you already hired? We'll pay them. We'll figure this all out. So, uh, you know, one of the things that the engineer said was um, the windows were not flashed properly. And uh, I don't know, there's two interesting things about these windows. What do, what do we think? What are you noticing here? Big brick mold. Big brick mold, okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. What else? What's wrong with these windows? No cap flashing. Someone said that. All right, you get a gold star. Nice job. All right, what else? No lintel. It's, oh, no, there we is. hit it. Okay. We hit the lintel. Yeah, where's this in relation to where a window would normally be in a frame house with stone veneer? Close to the front. Forward. Yeah, sticking way out because the architect wanted it to look like an old stone house. So the windows are actually projected out about four inches. Um, so, uh, yeah, no head flashing, projected out. Um, and we actually did not use like caulking around the perimeter of these, but. Uh, so the consulting engineer, first thing we did was we got out there and, and tore out like 10 pieces of stone on three or four windows, mm -hmm. and we started spraying it with a garden hose, uh, and they did not leak because we were so worried about these crazy projected windows that we'd use like miles of roofing peel and stick all around them. Um, they, they were absolutely not going to leak. So that actually turned out, you know, this, so this fax was wrong, which we felt, we felt so good about that. Um, you know, consulting engineer. Anyway, um, so then the next thing we do is we're setting up in the middle of this gorgeous finished house and the guys in the bunny suits are in here. And um, this is probably about when I bought one of those respirators, which I still have. Those are great. I mean, those are such good dust masks. I, and they're really handy to have during the last two years. Anyway, uh, I, I don't know if you can tell this in this uh, 1999 phone technology, but there's a bunch of stuff growing on the back of the drywall. Um, we used to call it mold, but now we call it biological growth. Anyway, uh, we had the, you know, we had the old uh, rusty, the best tip all day that you've rusty given us, fasteners. Right? Yeah, hey, I'm not a mold expert. It might be Archaea, which yeah. I didn't even know what that was until a couple years ago. This is good. Yeah, I'm yeah this bacteria down. could be anything. Um, so there's definitely a water problem, but, um, you know, and you, you can look in, in, you can see these little trim nails here. Um, they're ru very, very rusty. This is holding up the crown, so I'm like taking a picture up inside. And uh, you know, there's uh, some staining on the framing. I mean, what are what are we learning from the staining on the framing? It rained during construction. It rained during construction. See, you, you're the smart one. He said we're smart. I, all I know is our our repair team has fixed like thirty thousand problems the last twenty years. That's what I know. I don't know if I'm. I've smart. just made a lot of YouTube videos about yeah. dumb things I've done. There you That's go. All. And you can see there's white stuff growing on the back of the thing. We, have got, we had white stuff and black stuff. It was pretty cool. But how about the, how about the OSB? How's that look? Pretty good. It's fine. It's about the cleanest OSB you'll ever see on a job site. It was perfect. So how about this? Does that window look like it's leaking profusely? Yeah. All right, who, who's got a guess about what's going on?
ding, ding, ding. Yes. All right. So it's condensation. That's smart. So the audience smart. said wallpaper, oh, by the right. way, in case yeah, you couldn't hear that on the Sorry, uh, interwebs. I was going to take a second to get to there, but we're, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I'll give you one other clue. If, if, it's not, if the picture isn't coming clear, I, I, I rolled up to this house after one of those afternoon thunder showers, and uh, this is what the wall looked like. And you can see part of the wall isn't wet. It's, uh, it's this part right here, like three inches here and, and like an inch and a half here. <laughs> That's the part of the wall that isn't soaking wet. So the entire wall is the soaked. The entire basically. wall is soaking wet. Like we, our windy thunderstorms throw a lot of water on houses. In fact, that's, um, this is another ha custom house we did. And you can see that section over there, the stucco um, has this really cool rain pattern on it. Right? And these are, these are houses have big overhangs. You know, nowadays a lot of houses have no overhangs or regular houses like mine has like a four inch overhang. These are like fancy houses like with a foot or 16 inches. And you can still see most of the wall gets soaking mm -hmm. wet in a, in a heavy storm. So, and you can't tell, but all that stone's soaked too. Oh, 100%. It's yeah. saturated. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so I got on the internet, and, and I don't know how uh, Alta Vista or whoever directed me, but somebody got me to Joe Seabrecht's uh, buildingscience.com website, which is so helpful. And you know, I think he only had 10 articles up at the time, but one of them was about vinyl wallpaper in the South. And uh, he, he sort of explained it this way. This, is, this diagram's a little bit interesting, but I think a lot of weird problems, it's a little bit complicated, but a lot of weird problems fall into this. So if you'll indulge me, I'll just go through this real quick. So a lot of times we get wetting that happens all at once, because it's usually rain, right? Or uh, you know, something along those lines, an event that happens in a, usually a short, relatively short time frame. And, it, and then most of our building assemblies will dry slowly over time. You know, what moisture has to go through the OSB and through the drywall and, and, and through all this stuff, or the other direction. It has to make it all the way through the, out through the stone or whatever the heck you have on the roof. Um, so the drying happens slowly, the wetting happens quickly, and the wetting will sort of fill up this water bucket inside your building assembly. And your building assembly has a, an ability to, say, to store a certain amount of water without failing. But if you fill up the bucket too fast or your drying is too slow, your building will tip over into failure. And I think that's what happened on this one gable end wall is we, that side got more rain and it got more sun and the, uh, because of the direction it faced. And so we had, uh, when the sun hits soaking wet stone the day or the afternoon after that one of those thunderstorms, it you know, that moisture gets really excited and it goes running all over the place. A bunch of it runs through the OSB and through the insulation and through gypsum board very quickly. But if you put something after that that prevents it from drying to the inside, it will just accumulate there. And they had this vinyl wallpaper, very fancy English vinyl wallpaper on the inside of the wall. So the consulting engineers, just to finish out the story, I gotta, throw, I gotta throw someone else under the bus here, told us that this was how to fix this. Put the craft fa facing on the insulation on the faces of the studs and tape any joints in it. And then put the vinyl that, wallpaper back on. Does that on. make sense? Is that, that's gonna stop us? Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> that would be your that might be your best case scenario, right? I mean, one good thing with craft paper is it is very it's actually kind of perfect for our climate because we have bidirectional moisture flow. Wintertime is generally trying to get out of the house. Summertime is generally trying to get in. And craft paper will loosen up. Uh, it's it's not a not, it's not a very tight vapor barrier to begin with, vapor retarder. And the wetter it gets, the more vapor it allows through. So when you need drying, it will allow it. So uh, we we have unfaced or craft face is our spec when we use fiberglass. Anyway, we did this to humor them and we made them sign a piece of paper that said, we're doing this, but you really should not put this wallpaper back up. And the clients found a matching wallpaper, close enough matching wallpaper that was not vinyl and the house has performed ever since. That's amazing. Yeah. So, That's really cool. I feel yeah. like I should clap after that, Doug. That was well, it's just a, <laughs> was I really mean, good. what a story. And that, I'm, like every like everyone else would say it's you know like your story it's a good it, when you run into something like that you feel the pain you're you know like this was driving me crazy for months and i didn't want the clients to go through that or us mm -hmm. it was very expensive and and then i realized i got a whole nother level i got to learn about uh and and here we are
So Doug, at the end of the day, was this really considered your mistake? Did you put up the wallpaper? Um, I don't even remember, but we paid, we paid for the, we paid for the whole shebang. We paid the lawyer, we paid the engineer, mm -hmm. even though they were wrong. I'm not bitter. And we paid, uh, <laughs> we paid the mold consultant who is just a rip off artist. Oh, and so you know, we did, we, we paid for the whole thing. Everyone's happy though. So good. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's happy except that you didn't get paid for six months. Well, I'm happy now because look, look what I learned. I yeah. found Joe Sieberick's website and then yeah. I met you guys. <laughs> So, so here's a takeaway that, that uh, is worth saying. What are some other vapor barriers besides vinyl wallpaper mm. that we put on our walls in our houses? Uh, I'd throw yeah. this out to the audience, but you guys aren't Mike, so I'm going to throw it out to my colleagues. Uh, you know, you probably know where I'm going with this. What are, what are one or two other things that we put on our walls that could cause mold because they're stopping that drying from the wall cavity to the inside? Have you guys experienced any firsthand? You find it in bathrooms, especially with mirrors. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll have that uh, that slight gap, uh, you know, with the mirror mastic. Yep. So the more mirror mastic, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. If you're going to cover any wall with any type of, you know, uh, stone product, uh, that is large format stone product. Um, you got to watch that. You yeah. got to watch any type of uh, oil based paints mm -hmm. that would go over plaster. That's right. So those kind of things. Anything that is, you don't want a vapor barrier, um, and it even depends on a retarder, but you, you really don't want that on the inside of the construction here where we are actually in, here and going north. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my builder buddies in Austin made the mirror on the outside wall mistake and remodeled a house that he had built originally and remodeled their bathroom a couple years ago and called me and was like, you never believe this, I took the mirror off and it was all black behind there. And he had done the research and knew, but was shocked that it actually happened. And what he's gone to do now, and I thought it was a genius idea, was whenever there's a mirror on the outside wall, he's putting some one by twos on, I have his finished carpenter nail those into the studs and then mirror mastics to the one by two. So every mirror on his outside walls has a three quarter inch air gap and mm -hmm. there's, able, there's able to air flow through there. Mm -hmm. And I haven't taken that apart before, but in theory that seems like it really works. And what I love about that is this is a builder who's using his building science knowledge and training and seeing the mistakes and going, oh, well here's how to fix it. We can just make sure there's airflow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can make sure that if we have a cavity that's unvented, that we vent it. Uh, you know, if we're gonna use uh, open cell foam, we better think about how we're gonna condition the space below that open cell foam. Uh, or we should maybe consider to go into closed cell foam. Uh, at my house, I used rock wool on my entire inside. I stayed away from foam except for two areas that I needed it because I needed higher R value per <laughs> inch. Um, but I also have, in my climate, issues with moisture that comes into my, ca into my houses through airflow, brings usually high humidity and it's really easy to cause problems with that. So I did a really well air sealed box uh, on my personal house using Joe Stebrick's perfect wall concept. And I used Huber Zips uh, system sheathing with tape on all my seams. And I made sure that my walls landed right on my roof so that I could tape that joint between the roof and the wall. And then I built my overhang on top of that later. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the perfect wall series of uh, articles that Joe's built. They're all for free on building, it's buildingscience.com, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you could just type in perfect wall on that. Um, we still have a few more minutes and I really would like to come back to you, George, and have you spend a few minutes talking to us about some of your fluid applied details. Can I switch back to your slides? Sure. While I'm doing that, will you tell these guys uh, about when you made that switch and, and uh, why you like fluid and actually maybe even define what we're talking about? Well, there are products called WRBs, weather resistive barriers, and uh, not too sure what that means, but, uh, and then there's other problems that, it, uh, other products that are <coughs> waterproofing. So when you're looking to uh, waterproof something to keep bulk water out, you're looking at a product that is um, so differently than you would put a, uh, you know, a, a very um, stout waterproofing product below grade. <coughs> um, the idea 
uh, you know, hit me a number of years ago to say, hey, let's just, it's like a strawberry and a chocolate uh, thing. You stick that stick in the strawberry and you stick it down in the chocolate. You want to cover that whole thing. And that's the vision that I had. Uh, that's I, a great analogy. I do I like, like strawberries. That. I'm I stealing like that analogy. Yeah, yeah. So you stick it down in there and it coats it. I'm talking about from the footing all the way to the tip of the roof. Um, and so for me and our comp for me and my company, the I said, what is going to be the best? We tried a number of products. So you, you've tried, you know, the peel and sticks, and but when the guys are 15 or 30 feet in the air, you know, <coughs> bouncing off of pump jacks and it's, you know, whipping up about 15 to 20 knots, it's real tough to get that, you know, release paper off and then get it stuck in the right place. Not to mention the fact that you've got a you know, seal window sill with it, right? Where it actually turns up and turns in, multi-directional. And if you've ever seen the details in, Tyvek is one of them, they give you all these details of how to cut it, how to cut a little strip and put it down in there. And that's like, holy smoly, I'm recovering from a hangover and I gotta do that? It doesn't work. So- um, Well, not you personally, but- Oh, uh, well, maybe. But, maybe, uh, I mean. Yeah. The, uh, it just doesn't work. And, and uh, at, at one of Stevick's uh, thing, uh, classes early on, he brought a guy in and gave us an eight hour uh, 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 presentation about process. And he, and he showed, and I spent using all this data from World War II in the production, he showed that if the process isn't simple and repeatable and verifiable, that the guys aren't gonna, you know, aren't gonna uh, you know, stick with it, learn it, and stick with it, and all the rest of that. So, uh, that opened my eyes. So, I looked at all kind of different products out there, and I said, um, you know, punch them out there. And I said, uh, what's going to be the best? So, we stumbled across, uh, stumbled, Joe introduced me to uh, the guys at Tremco. And I met them in the early 2000s, very early on. I think the liquid apply was in, at first used in Boston. and. In 99 to 2000, we start using that in 2000, and uh, not 230 wasn't around then, but uh, start using that in uh, in the early 2000s. And in fact, that one the house had that on it. Mm. We just didn't do the the roof right. Um, since then, we developed systems to put everything together in uh, in liquid applied. Origami doesn't work, um, you know, for me. And uh, Joe disagrees with me on a lot of these items when it comes to that, but I like the, I like the liquid applied. So I use Tremco Exoware. It's a, it's a, uh, a commercial grade product. It goes on 70 mil thick. You can spray it or roll it. it vapor permeability is anywhere from 12 to 15 to 18. So it's perfect for our area. They make a vapor closed product, you know, for further north, and they also make, you know, a this is a, an acrylic. So it it'll work behind uh, you know uh, you know walls that are uh, that are open to sun for a long period of time. They make a 220 that goes on and it uh, it's asphaltic base, but you need to cover it up within four to six months. Um, it is uh, this is our go-to product right here. Uh, that slide is turned sideways. So oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I never turned this for okay. you, George. That's so my what fault. you see is that hinge is a is a window. That that's slide's it. supposed to go like this. Sorry, you, all that's yep. my fault. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the, that's gray is the 230, and you can see how it turns, uh, uh, you can see how it not turns, but you'll see the roller marks in there. Uh, that was rolled on, uh, very, 70 mil is very thick, and that, that uh, one by around there is just so the insulation can bump, bump up to it, and then you can tape the window in. <coughs> and that's what we do, that should be turned up. So these are just... Uh, photographs that we took in our in our warehouse to show the guys, hey, this is what we use. Uh, we've tested maybe 300 tapes, and I did a three-year test with them. Wow! And I found Pollockin is the best, uh, and they make a and that's a butyl butyl back, and it works really well with the acrylic. It works well with the typical paints that you find on the windows. Mm. You cannot, you can, but you should paint the windows first, and make sure they're in there. The tape goes over that gap. And there's another shot of it. There's another shot up high. I need to make sure that tape really sticks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you that. So you do the sides. Yeah, you got to do. <laughs> you do the sides first, and then the top after that. And there's how you make it stick. You get a guy 
just his arm, you don't need the rest of it, <laughs> and uh, with the metal roller, and you roll the living snot out of it. You've got to roll all those little humps and bumps out of it. And then, so you don't want it opening up, you um, roll it again, and then you roll it again, and right there is the, uh, that is the rock wool. Um, uh, that was you so uh, that's exterior comfort board rock wool, right yeah yeah that's what it is. and so it. is that why you had a uh, a bump the in bump. the window the window is bumped out to that's exactly allow a right. buck for that mm -hmm. rock wool to come that's in there exactly right that's cool so if you're bumping it at you know one inch or two inch or three inch you you know that uh, you you put that framing uh, and by. and don't uh, don't think that George is kidding about this you got to roll the heck out of it the rolling is super important I mean everybody's literature that has any tape tells you to roll it it's because when you roll it, the nerds call it wetting the adhesive to the substrate. And Huber talks about this a lot. And, and you have to roll your zip tape. Uh, you have to roll this tape. The idea is that you're pushing that adhesive and you kind of, you, sm you smear that adhesive into the substrate. And then it's like, oh, okay, I need to grab on. If you just wipe it down with your hands, you're gonna come back the next day. And that's why they call it stick and peel. Or 10 it, years later. Or yeah. 10 years later, yeah. it is so definitely not stuck. We've opened stuff up that I did in the, in the 80s and 90s, and there's all kinds of openings that are now full of dirt. In the, we, we actually now, we handed these out to everyone in the company about, uh, you know, I don't know, a few years ago, one of our training meetings. And now if you join us as a project manager, you get a notebook with a bunch of uh, installation instructions and a roller. That's awesome. Mm. So I love it, we're hiring, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Good plug. Good free roller. Here. This is going out to the whole roller. world right up. now. Yep. So you roll the snot out of it, and then Love you uh, terminate it. Any, anything, any tape, this is the problem I have. I like Huber zip ball, but you've you got to really roll it. Mm -hmm. And you know I've dealt with them and said I would still want to terminate that tape. Mm -hmm. So define that. For people who don't know that, what he's, what he's saying is, or I'm defining for you. I tell you to do it, then I'm saying. You do a good job. Sorry. So what, he's, what you're seeing in the top there, that's that fluid applied. That's that Tremco, the gray stuff that probably was rolled on or could be sprayed on. And then he taped the window to that. And then he's stitching it in, as I, I like that term. I don't know who told me that. But this, this termination that he's got with um, uh, a different product from those guys, that's Dimonic 100? I believe that's Dimonic, yeah. But if you were using Huber Zip, you could use their fluid applied on their tape if you wanted to. Uh, I use a lot of Polywall products and they make a termination sealant. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you're stitching that together so that those seams lock together. And now you notice, now if gravity uh, comes down, you'd be worried that tape, if it had a fish mouth on it, would funnel the water in. Mm -hmm. Now it's stitched together, it's closed up. And that's, that's a great extra step. Yeah, Tremco, along with Henry and a number of the other companies, make a whole family of products that tend to be very compatible. And I'm just, I'm familiar with Henry, I'm familiar, I use primarily Tremco. We buy tractor trailer loads of that stuff. Literally, he's not kidding you guys, he buys it by the tractor load. Yeah, so it's tough to get right now. Because most of your houses are what, a thousand or two thousand square feet, something like About that? About that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. normally. <laughs> and you know, they're, yeah. For, that's for the second kitchen. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> for the pantry. <clears throat> that, for the pantry, no, that's the master bedroom closet for her. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's the, uh, yeah, that's been the experience. Okay. And so you'll, you'll see that, that photograph has turned. The guys, I told them it has to be done, you know, on all the horizontals, but they've gotten it to the point where they were doing the verticals too. And then they smooth it out to make it look pretty, but it doesn't need, you really want to smooth it out because then again, you're stitching it back into mm -hmm. filling any little holes or gaps or all the rest of that. On top of, on top of this, it gets flashed. And if you're gonna flash it, you put the trim up, flash over top the trim, and you have to tie the trim back into the waterproofing air barrier layer by putting a strip of tape and then terminating that. It's a lot of work and yep. it's very expensive. Yep. So this is what we do with the door. This is a, a, you know, a mock-up that we did, a training mock-up that we did. That product right there is Tremco 350. So it's, it's a waterproof, um, uh, product that's meant for shower stalls and that kind of thing. And we adopted it for here because it's waterproof. It's not 
you know, weather resistant, it's waterproof. <laughs> and the little corner is where doors leak the most. And if you've been involved in the testing and that kind of thing, that's what we find. So we put the 350 down and then we run the 230 over top of it all the way back in and, and face everything off. But you're going to put a, a really tough, you know, uh, product there because what, the doors don't just come, they lift up these thousand pound doors and set them down very gently. They slide them all over the place and kick them in place and, and that's it. So it, you've got to set it up right. So um, what is that? What is that? Just a plastic strip basically, George? That, that black is, thing? That is, they, there's a company called Astro, Astro Pan. Oh yeah. Astro Pan. Okay. And we use only plastic because it's thermally not conductive, mm -hmm. uh, not thermally conductive. And if you use metal, I, you know, I've seen some jobs where gone out forensically looked at some jobs and they did a beautiful copper pan. It's turned up on the inside it's, and it's all soldered and all that. Then they stuck a aluminum sliding door right on top oh. of it and wondered why everything was falling apart. But um, that is issue there, you just the metals are dissimilar. That's right. That issue there, you don't have that problem here. And that's why, nor do you have a thermal, very large house we built in 2000, uh, the same thing, and we brought it up, very expensive wallpaper, uh, and the, we got a phone call a few years later, what is that black line at the wallpaper right there? And I went there, and by then I had figured it out, I said, oh, damn, it's cold outside, and that metal is cold, and when you touch it, it's cold, and it's warm and moist in the house, it condensed, there it is behind the wallpaper. This wasn't vinyl wallpaper, but it was, it was nonetheless very expensive. So, mm -hmm. you know, I learned a lesson with that too. <laughs> so, um, we do that corner. Diamonic 100 is kind of the go-to uh, product that they have. It it works with all of their all of their products. Uh, might get a little bleeding. That's what we do. We use three-quarter inch plywood in every one of our houses on the exterior because it we've got it engineered so that you don't have to get the uh, brick or stone tie into a stud. And the times that we've done forensic work, and I'm sure that, uh, Doug, you'll verify this too, that the guys, when they, or the people, when they put the whole thing together, you're asking a mason to put a screw in and hit a stud, or a carpenter even to do that with insulation on the outside or the waterproofing products on the outside, they never hit the stud. Yeah, now, stucco you, people. Huh? Stucco people, Oh, everybody. same thing. Everybody. Yeah. So if you take a look at the type of plywood that we use, we've engineered it. We have a whole nailing system for that. It's glued. And then that, we don't have to hit anything. And we just plop that down while we're dealing with the architect and the engineer uh, and say, hey, this is our exterior sheathing thing. And it, let me pause you for one sec, because yeah. that's a really big revelation that I learned from you 10 or 15 years ago. And, and you probably heard it, but just to make sure that we all understood, what he means is that now when the mason comes, or anybody who's fastening, for that matter, really, because that three-quarter plywood is so meaty, we're not as worried about hitting studs. You probably still want them to hit studs some, right? But if you miss some studs, you hit it in plywood, that plywood's got enough meat to actually hold the fastener. No, it's, it's engineered, actually, specifically engineered for, you know, we picked, I don't know, 130 mile an hour wind, and, oh and if gosh. we're doing the ocean, we might, bump the nailing pattern up or screwing pattern, the plywood works. That's amazing. And in fact, the weakest part of it you would think would be in between the studs, it isn't. It's right up against the stud because that's where the most force would be exerted for pull out. Ah. And that's the whole reason for the glue, the spiral nails and all the rest of that. Got it. And then the the other thing we have, we, we make sure that uh, if you overdrive nails, uh, you know, so if you take a half inch or seven sixteenths into OSB and you drive the nail halfway through it, you basically have about, you know, a quarter, quarter inch, inch plywood. That's about what you got. And so we went through that whole process to understand. And one other point I want to make on that too, which I think is pretty interesting. Doug talked about the rate of wetting versus the, or the rate of drying. And your, your building had that, uh, that bucket of, uh, or that kind of weight at one end and the bucket was at the other end. Mm -hmm. Well, the two by fours and the plywood make that weight on the end even bigger. It, it adds this nerdy word that uh, Joey's gonna make fun of me later for saying, but it adds hygric buffer capacity yeah. to the house, which is a really fancy way of saying there's more wood. And that real wood 
will soak up more water, more moisture, more whatever that might get in the cavity, whether it's condensation, whether it's liquid water, which means that you have more capacity to not have a problem. If you have OSB and you have a real thin stud, or maybe you're building out of metal studs, heaven forbid, or some other things, there's less ability for moisture to soak up. And it's why those old houses that were built in the you know, 1920s or older that had real sheathing and real old growth lumber, they could soak up tons of water and then they would dry because there was lots of airflow and they never had problems. And you remodel those today and they look great as long as someone didn't stuff a bunch of insulation in them and stop that drying. And so by George going to three quarter plywood, that's just that much more real wood in the house. So it's, it's genius, I love it. Keep going brother, sorry to interrupt. So there, there's a little bit cl a close up of the 350. And again, Henry, you know, I don't own stock in Tremco by the way, but Henry, uh, uh, Henry makes a lot of these liquid apply products. Yeah, and I use a lot of Prosco products. Yeah. I like their family. They have, they have Cat5, beautiful product. It's like putting Caro syrup on the wall. No, it's awesome. a paintbrush. It's Which really good. Yeah. What were you going to say, Doug? I, I, this is extremely nerdy, but is that an acrylic or is that the polyurethane? That's polyurethane there. That uh -huh. The 350 and is. Have you ever seen that issue that they talked about at, uh, at summer camp a few years ago with the uh, osmotic pressure uh, on, the, on the polyurethane fluid applied? You mean blowing it off the wall? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen it on, on okay. even vapor open stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, this stuff is meant to to keep bulk water from going down that way, mm -hmm. and and vapor drive it, it won't go through it. But if the wood gets wet behind, mm -hmm. which is you don't have the the roof secured properly, wood gets wet behind, and it, and you get the proper sun, it'll blow it'll blister the stuff, takes mm -hmm. it right off the wall. Wow. Yeah. This is not negative side waterproofing. And that's a little bit better of a deal. We cut those corners out of Astro Pan, and you'll see what happens. We goopy the bottom of the doors to make sure that uh, any water gets in there, we're not going to have a problem. And, um, and then it fits into place. That is Dimonic 100, and we lather that, slather that stuff all over it. We just cram it in there. You want, when you drop that door in, you want that stuff leaking out everywhere. Where? This is a barrier system. Um, Joe and I have talked about using, you know, doing the same thing we do with a window for this, but I just found that to be a little bit more problematic. Mm. And uh, there's issues with wind-driven rain with that approach. So I like the, the barrier, and you'll see that, hey, there's two lines going that way, there's two lines going that way, oh, now there's three lines <coughs> going that way, and then there'll be four lines, okay? <laughs> so you just goopy, we, you know, we buy a tractor trailer load of that for every house. And once you set that in, you go to move that door three or four days later, you might as well kiss that whole sill goodbye. You just got to cut the, cut the sill out. you cutting the house apart to get it out of there. That's awesome. And that was pretty much it there. That's and it. then we air seal on the inside and a few other things. And that's our system. When a client asks you to do something that you know is dumb because there's been a problem or because you've used that product or that technique or that whatever, what do you say to, let's say, the client or the architect? And then also, what advice would you give builders that are 20 years younger than you when they see a project, let's say, George, that has a, uh, you know, living space, uh, a, or a, pardon me, an outdoor space with a flat roof and, you know, is, is a more complicated, more um, uh, high exposure, any of those kinds of things. Do you have any advice for that younger generation of builders on that? So, so two questions on that. We'll just go down the line, George, you go first. I would say that um, part of the problem that we as builders bounce up against is cost. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people say, well, I've heard this product A works well and I, I think this, I can buy this over here cheaper and all the rest of that. Uh, figure out what's gonna work and what is gonna work for you know, 30 or 40 or 50 years. Because if you think it's gonna work for 10, then it's gonna work for about three to five. <laughs> if you think it's gonna work 20, it's gonna work about 10. If you think it's gonna work like a lifetime type thing, you might get 30 years out of it. And I just have, have found over the, over the years that I, can't, I sometimes when we bid projects, we can't compete against those people that don't understand what we understand. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I don't know, a lot of people here work with architects. You, you know, we, 
we work with guys all over the country. And um, what we do is bring them the solutions up front. We say, look, here's our manual. This is what we do with the window and the door. This is how I, you know, put, you know, Heckman Posi ties up. This is the products that we use. And I have found that I've only run into one architect in the last maybe 20 years that had a very firm understanding of bulk water management and all the rest of that. And he and I, you know, we got along really well. And, um, you know, and it, it took him a, me to, you know, I said, look, the whole reason why I want to use Tremco is my guys know the stuff. They know, number one, you don't drink any of it. And number two, <laughs> they know that the gray stuff is 230 and, the, and they know the stuff. They know the tape. They know the product. Yeah. When you get them outside of that comfort zone, you don't want to do that because that screws the process up yeah. that they've, they've been going over and have been testing. That's your system that you've yeah. got and down. There's a number of things I can say to an architect and say, look, I'm, you know, I've got a lot of gray hair. It, what i got left is gray. <laughs> and I've been doing this and I've screwed up plenty, plenty of times. And I'm not going to screw that up because I did that in 1993 and screwed that up that way. So we're not going to do it this way. Yeah. And you make a joke out of it. I mean, I cannot go and say, I'm not, you know, heck, this, this is where our business comes from. Mm -hmm. Like I said, 99% of what we got is that architect picks up and hey, I got one for you guys. Hey, come on down here and take a look and mm -hmm. meet the client, you know, and on, on, on. And that is, you know, that's critical to our business. And, um, and what, why we put together all these details, did all this testing and do all that testing and when Gary comes out and tests everything is so that I can say to the client, there it is. Um, you know, I got the waterproofing end, I'll make your house dry, I'll do the HVAC system right, let him make the thing look pretty and we'll throw some paint on it and be done. I love it. How about you, Ethan? What do, what do you say to those clients <coughs> who want to do something or use a product or whatever Mm -hmm. that you feel like, gosh, that's going to be a problem. Right. I mean, overall, we have chosen to be in a very risky business. And what we do every day is manage risk. Mm -hmm. And when you think something is going to be a higher risk than makes sense to you, you've got to manage that risk. Mm -hmm. You've got to work with your team. You've got to work with your design team and specifications said. to say, this is how we can minimize the risk of failure. Mm -hmm. And to educate the client, whether they're an architect or a homeowner or both, that we're staking our reputation on building great systems that are going to perform well and we recommend that you spend a little bit more on this because you don't want to see us back here in 10 years from now and you want to be able to sell your home with our our name and label on the house so that people know it's been done really well yeah that's a great way to say it that's hard to compete that's hard to follow up with yeah, Do you have I mean, any uh, additional great advice besides ethan's that's no, pretty awesome that's the philosophy, which, which actually, I think you put that very well. Nice job. Yeah, that was excellent. But uh, we, we actually, you know, we have a physical piece of paper. When someone wants to do something that we think has a very high likelihood of failure, we write out, you know, <clears throat> we're not warranting this for these things because we've seen this happen in the past. Do you want to do this with no warranty? And that a lot of times, a lot of times they do. It's their money, it's their house. Knock yourself out. We yeah. just don't want to pay for it ourselves 10 years from now. That's really smart. That's a, that's a I mean, good piece of advice worked, right there. It's worked reasonably well. I mean, believe me, I've done it the wrong way. I've had that conversation verbally, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then it's a problem. Forget it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I'll, I'll follow up with that other question that I didn't ask you guys because we're running short on time, which is, you know, if you're a builder watching this who's 20 years younger than us up here, uh, the advice I'd have for the 35-year-old Matt Reisinger would be, you know, be cautious about those super cool, super exciting, whatever projects that you don't quite know how you're going to do it or what those details look like. And I'm not saying do, be zero risk, right? I mean, as, as you said, we're not, we're not totally risk averse as builders, but we also don't go to Vegas with our retirement money this weekend either, right? We, we got to be smart about the risks that we take. So when you see a project or a client uh, that you feel like is especially high risk, don't be afraid to say no. Uh, and certainly that might be easier to say in 2021 when we're pretty busy. That may get a little harder if you're watching this in 2025 and the economy's not as good. But uh, I've made more money on jobs that I didn't do than I did on jobs that I've done. And I can think of several projects of mine that washed out for whatever reason. 
and I hear back later about the lawsuits or about the, the you know, the builder who's like, oh my gosh, Reisinger, you won't believe what I'm going through <laughs> with this client that I, you know, I know you interviewed for or whatever. So, you know, if, if your spidey sense tells you that something's uh, amiss or that, gosh, I just, I'm really worried about how to do this without it being a problem, consider passing on that project. That being said, gentlemen, thank you so much for being willing to uh, share with us and, and give us your wisdom. Uh, and if you're watching this uh, on a pre-recorded, not live, sign up for our newsletter, guys. We, uh, we send two newsletters a week. Believe it or not, over on buildshownetwork.com, we're up to 10 new videos a week from job sites around the country. And it's really fun for me to get together in a live event like this and meet some of you guys and hear how our videos, our content, has shaped your business and kept you out of trouble. And that's ultimately what today was about, was shaping your business, helping you stay out of trouble in the future. So I really thank you guys from the, uh, from the live audience being here. And for those of you who are watching this online, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show. <laughs> My dorky out there, I gotta, I gotta do it every time. <laughs>